Hi, my name's Wesley, the Dungeon Master for The Stranger. We're remastering all of our original episodes, and this one was particularly challenging. Unfortunately, my audio was damaged beyond repair, and so I have gone ahead and redubbed this entire session. It's taken a very long time, but hopefully you'll enjoy the outcome. Please enjoy the session. A scream reverberates the floorboards of this old hotel. Coming from the floor below you, the fifth floor, the one that nobody is supposed to go to, the one that's been under renovation for 30 years, in this hotel that you have no choice to be at because the saturation has come early. The island surrounded and enveloped by a fog, a mist of salt that in one breath would fill your lungs. You're at the Whaler Hotel, an establishment that has been closed for 30 years. Just recently reopened to accommodate those marooned from Her Royal Rose, that ship you took here only to get stranded because of the early onset of the saturation. Nihilus and Esper, you rush back to the room As the rain patters outside, the door slams behind you, and the group is rejoined. Y'all heard that too, right? Certainly did. (sighs) He looks towards Esper. They... she... the the woman, um, I think her name... Margaret? No, none of her employees wanted to go, so she went herself. And, And then... then the scream. There is something terribly amiss going on on the fifth floor. I think we should make haste. She herself ventured on alone. We must intervene. We simply must. I can do this on my own. I... If you wanna... I I don't know if I should... I feel like I need to go. Trevor, whatever you want to do, I am... Well, I'm probably not at your side, as I'm a little slow, but... I'm behind you, and I'm here to help. It's the least I can do. Wipes his chin slightly. Gives a little bit of a sharp inhale. Well, let's go then. As he gives a bit of a shrug and just turns back to uh, Nihilus and Esperanza. You said fifth floor? Yes. Quick, you know. As he was saying, let's go, he probably hands you over your shield. Uh Uh-huh. Thank you. Quickly. This way. And he goes down the stairs. Walking through the regal halls of the Whaler Hotel, you pass by eloquent portraits, fluorescent lighting, and a beautiful renovation that's been done in this hallway, making your way to the stairwell as you descend one floor to the fifth floor to an old door that's weathered has a draft coming around its edges, a cold breeze meets your hand as you put it nearby. There's no window into this floor, just that weathered, unkempt old door. What would you like to do? And Dr. Glass did bring the echo light with her. It's currently shedding light. And she looks around and there's no one around, right? No, this stairwell is empty. She transfers it to her mage hand so that she has a hand free. The mage hand floats into the air, holding your echo light up. Oh, well, do the right thing ain't always the fun thing. So uh, we just, he's going to reach out and test the door just to verify that it is indeed locked. You grab the handle and give it a turn. Nothing happens. Though it's loose, the door being weathered with age... And besides that, it's bolted shut. Just turn uh, over to uh, Esper. Every second counts, right? Uh, just, um, please, please be careful. Barely waits for Esper to finish the sentence before he backs up. And he's just going to do a big push kick of 
the door right up the uh, right on the knob just to try and break it off the hinges. Please roll athletics. Uh, Trevor going to town. That's a 23. <laughs> That's a good roll. You take a few steps back and with a running start, you slam the door open with your body. The doorknob breaks off and you stop yourself, letting the door creak open the rest of the way. It reveals the dimly lit fifth floor. There's dust that covers the floor, except that where footsteps might have traversed through the center, cobwebs from spiders and the occasional scurry of a rat. You see the old fashioned wallpaper peeling and curling at the edges and Dr. Glass being one of the only people who were here in your early days you can recognize the old opulence that used to be this hotel. The brass embellishments still eloquent and tasteful for its old age. The storm on the outside, it picks up. You hear thunder in the distance as you begin to traverse these halls. Seeing the tension from everyone around, uh, Nihilus starts to... to hold the holy cross and begin a whisper as they continue to walk by the grace of Soros I beseech thee to bestow thy radiant light upon this object illuminating it with your sacred brilliance as he casts the cantrip light on his holy cross in order to illuminate the room clearly and the light illuminates the room it glows down these dark narrow hallways and it reveals that the footsteps, they lead to the door in the center, room 505. Dr. Glass gestures to everyone to like lean in to the echo light to, to listen. You know, we heard horrible sounds through the echo light before and she's still exhausted and not not at, on her best game, and so she's hoping that someone will hear how bad things are. You see, you see them footprints, right? Hmm. Looks like we just follow them. We find her, right, Maggie? Yeah, yeah, Maggie. I would like to know what else we'll find, if possible. There, there were those those other sounds. When I was in the lobby earlier today, I heard rumors about this place being haunted from a from a time in its past. Although I thought it was merely fictional, let's find out for ourselves. Quickly, let's all listen and see if we can hear how many entities we're dealing with. And I at least would like to do a perception check, which... I get advantage on. I get a. Echo Light gives us advantage on sound based perception checks. So for me, that would be a straight roll since I have disadvantage on all skill checks right now, if I may. All right. Dr. Glass, please roll perception as a straight roll, canceling out your disadvantage. Uh, and that is a 14 perception. You turn on the Echo Light, it's cheap speaker buzzing in your ear. And at first you hear this rhythmic dripping sound, a leak somewhere on this fifth floor. But more notably, you begin to hear scurrying within the walls, within these metal ducts and vents, a monstrous sound that doesn't quite read as animalistic, but something else. Eventually everyone else hears that as well. Oh, dear. And Wes, is the scurrying, it's sort of just around, it doesn't sound localized to 505. It's just horrifying and in the walls. Well, first you notice that the banging against the metal, it's irregular. It starts almost right near you in those walls and it scurries towards the center of the room in the direction of room 505. On second thought, if we have committed to action, perhaps knowing less is better. 
Now you're talking my language. He's going to kind of start uh, very slowly with a lighter foot than you expect from someone this big. Uh, is going to start like creeping, following the footsteps that appear to be Margaret's. Kind of looking along the walls. The place just probably got rats. And he's just going to start slowly moving up. If you want to check the the other doors, see if we're not getting creeped up on, that's fine. And we'll see where this leads. Well, there's one more thing I could do, but it would take a few minutes. I could just cast about for, for magic, generally. But we'd ha- you'd all have to sit here and wait. I, I'm not saying that's a bad idea, but when something's making a sound like tearing meat, I'm not so sure it would be magic. Yeah, I'm not sure. And we likely don't have time. We can wait forever. I don't know how long Maggie can wait. Very wise. I'll let the young, strong people take the lead on this one. Huh. All right. And Esper will move up, still behind Trevor, but definitely on the more forward half of the group. I will say that Dr. Glass is watching uh, Esper curiously. She, I don't think she knows anything about Esper's abilities, and she notes that Esper identified as strong and as someone to take action. Trevor, you take your slow, shallow footsteps through the halls, making your way to room 505, where those markings in the floor lead. The floor creaks as you take your steps with Esper and the rest of the group following shortly behind you. As you arrive, you see the key to the door is still inside, turned to be unlocked. What do you do? Looking, uh, looking over at the the knob and the keyhole. Uh, is the keyhole one of those old-fashioned ones uh, with, like, the bulkier keys? It is, yes. Mm. So, uh, theoretically... If one were to pull the key out, would one be able to look in the keyhole? With an old lock like this? Certainly. I'm gonna look over at Esper and just whispering as quietly as he can. Just gonna go, I think I saw someone do this before. Let me see if this works. Uh, he's gonna very slowly reach a key, uh, reach for the key. Just rip out and just take it out of the keyhole. <laughs> He'll pocket that, and he'll just sort of kneel down and start to try and peer through and see if he can get a peek at the other side. You put your hand on the key and begin to pull it out, and at first it's met with resistance, which is expected from an old key in an old lock. But as you begin to pull, you feel the fleshy pull of meat as veins, tendons, and meat stretch out along with the key. What in heaven's hills? As you let go of the key in surprise, it dangles from the keyhole, attached by red sinew. As soon as the key is out and is now hanging by this little strand, there's just like a fuck, and just drops the key, like completely lets go of it. As it just sort of starts to swing from the keyhole. As you let go of the key, you can, however, see through the keyhole with a light that shines through. Well, um, well, I'd have to get all the way down there to look through the hole. So, you know, you're one of them short folk. Uh, why don't you take a look? (gasps) And she'll slowly, without saying anything, kind of turn her body to face the door. She'll have to tippy toe up a little bit. And slowly bring her, one of her eyes, just closer. She is also shaking like a leaf. You place your eye at the level of the keyhole and look through. You see the key-shaped outline with the mechanism that's in the door, the gears and cogs that drive the key. It doesn't just stop there, however, because you see a red tunnel, small, that when you look through it, reveals the room. 
And through that red tunnel, you see a table, chairs, and Maggie with her face down on one of the table settings. This room is clearly the largest in the hotel, far larger than those suites you've been gifted on the top floor. And you see Maggie's chest slowly rising and falling as she looks to be asleep at this table. Esther's going to take a few seconds to seem to drink that in and then slowly she's like almost it's almost like her skin is pulling her away to back up and she's going to bring a hand up to point at the the lock Maggie's inside something I think something is wrong with her well uh, we ain't gonna fix it out here we have to go in it looks, it looks strange. It sounds useless to say this, but it looks wrong. Right. Nihilus will grab the key from the floor, and in a very curious manner, he grabs the, the fleshy tendrils connected to it as well and starts to fiddle and smoosh it between his fingers to have a feel for the texture. Dr. Glass leans in a little bit to, to watch what he's doing with interest. Magnifying glass. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't both of you roll a medicine check? For a total of 24 with a natural 20. Do you still want me to roll my disadvantage <laughs> check? You know what? Why not? Let's see what happens. Yeah. So I will have to take the 17 for a 22. Hmm. Nihilus, you rub this material between your fingers and... As it squishes between them, you can't help but notice it strongly resembles veins and meat and blood. Humanoid, in fact. So fragile. The blood on the inside is dark and thick and rotten. It's clearly been here a while. He takes a whiff to it, to the smell and the texture and seeing how it bursts. He doesn't look horrified by it but his movement's a bit slower as he's trying to be careful with it as it does pop. <laughs> this, is, this can't be. This is human. It's like it's a living organism living inside of the hotel itself. And if I wasn't surrounded by all of you, I thought it would be a mere nightmare. We'll have to get, we have to get her back. And he will grab the key and force through his own will continue and try to open the door. The moment you push against the door, though unlocked, you notice there's resistance. It feels like there's something there, maybe 100 or 200 pounds. You can't tell what. <laughs> and he kind of like looks back towards uh, Trevor. <laughs> Would you be a dear? <laughs> what? Opening the door? You can definitely see how Nihilus' face and like his pressure, like he's like leaning with full weight against the door at this point. That would be quite helpful if you, if you could. <laughs> and um, he takes a step back. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, should have been a lock picker. This shit seems easy. I'm gonna back up. Uh, apparently, this is. There's a lot of weight behind here, so let's give it uh, the old bull rush. And he's gonna. Uh, bash his shoulder into the door frame. You slam against the door, crashing it open, and as it opens, it reveals a red streak on the ground where you had to push it. On the other side, a male elven body, its head with a hole in it, approximately doorknob-sized. As the body slumps forward from the crash, it dislodges and falls to the ground. Oh, I'm gonna be sick. Uh, uh. Can can Doctor Glass tell at all how recently this poor elf was killed? Please roll for me a medicine check. Ugh. Just a seven. The skin is pulled taut over its bones. You see clear signs of decay and rot. The blood is thick and purple, it's not fresh, and 
There's some bloating, and it's clearly been dead for a while. Uh, mm. Upon uh, shouldering open the door and seeing the, the corpse kind of tumble, you know, he like almost wasn't there for half a second before he comes back to reality. He just kind of gives a little uh, reflexive kick to the corpse, not to like damage it or anything, but almost like a push with his foot to get it away from him and just starts like looking around, uh, scanning for like he's in full fight or flight mode right now and is just scanning his environment. Looking around the room, you notice first two stairwells, one leading up and one leading down. You recall there's a stretch on the floor above where there's no room, so it must be a continuation of this suite. In the center, there's two large tables that could seat up to ten people. On either side, several rooms, doorways, a kitchen, and a fireplace. This place, this suite, it's ornate, it's old in its opulence. Though dusty, you can see there's streaks along the floor where clearly something has been sliding or dragging. In the wall, just near the doorway entering the room, there's a duct system. The building's climate control, where the panel that covers it has been ripped off. And in the center, you see Maggie, slumped over the table and asleep. Our Dr. Glass now does tell everyone that she points up at the ductwork and she says, I heard something unpleasant slithering away, something... I didn't recognize. And Wes, the, the poor elven person on the doorknob, are they connected to the key? Like, is the key of them? What was stuck to the key was a piece of viscera from their head. Esper, who had gone back for a moment after we opened the door to looking first at the corpse, but then very particularly to everybody else, eventually sets her eyes back on the thing that she originally saw in the room and she's going to begin to inch closer to the tables uh, Miss Miss Maggie you see she's clearly still asleep but I'd like for you to roll a medicine check as you approach investigating now that is a 13 minus 1 for 12 you see she's pale though there is some color to her cheeks she's been here for a little while and just as you see this, from the other room, you hear a slither or a skitter. And then it stops. Doctor, um, can, you, can you check on her? See if she's okay? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep an eye on this vent. We can't leave this room. Those stairs, he's pointing to either side of the room. We go up together. We don't separate... Keep eyes on all entrances and exits. Excellent, excellent thinking. Why don't the three of you watch the three entrances? And Wes, first of all, does any of this feel familiar or recognizable at all to Dr. Glass, either in her magic studies or is there something in, underneath her mind that recognizes this kind of awful shenanigan. Go ahead and please roll for me an insight check. Esper is going to uh, just reach up to the table and grab the first object that she can before wandering to an unoccupied thing to be watching. She has a fork. So 22. Insight. The room, it's colder than the rest of the hotel. You see your breath in front of you and there's a draft that makes its way through this room pricking up your hairs and giving your skin goosebumps. The body in the center, it doesn't stir like a regular sleeping person. As you approach, its sleep is unnaturally deep. And then you hear another skitter from the other room, a slither, a pounding of body, slime, and flesh, as I need everybody to roll a wisdom saving throw with disadvantage. Mm. Cool. So straight for me, haha. <laughs> While you're making your rolls, you begin to feel a charge in the air. The room, it fills with this dark mist that gathers out of the peripherals of your vision. At first it feels real, but you slowly realize it's your senses that are being affected. 
Please, everybody, give me your saving throws. Eleven for Nihilus. Nineteen for Dr. Glass. Nineteen for Trevor. Eight for Esper. Esper and Nihilus, you begin to feel tired. Your head and your hands feel heavy as you feel that if you don't brace immediately, you'll fall over. Glass and Trevor, you see as Nihilus and Esper's pupils dilate as they become pale and wobbly. Oh shit, I don't don't feel so well. Doctor, I, I shouldn't, why am I so tired? Everyone stay calm. Do I know I made a saving throw, first of all? Or because I saved, I don't I don't know that I did. You definitely know that you made a saving throw, and you can tell that in this moment, whatever's happening, it's cognitive, it's mental, it's non-physical, metaphysical. You can also tell that everybody experienced this at the same time, and specifically Nihilus and Esper are reacting to it a little bit more strongly than you are in this moment. As Trevor is noticing, Esper and Nihilus both start to feel a little off. Does it look like they're about to, like, uh, collapse, or... Nihilus like, looks like he's about to hurl all over you. Yeah. You do see that they're struggling to fight the urge to not fall asleep. However, it continues to be more exasperated as they blink and start to nod off. Nihilus, Esper, step outside the room, at least. The fact that she has begun to become drowsy as if she is going to fall asleep has her terrified. Doctor, I don't I don't want to sleep right now. Both of you out of this room, out the out the way we came. Get some air. Immediately. Doctor's orders. Quite alright. I had I had a about a large cup of coffee earlier today, and it's merely its side effects. Trevor, get them out of here. Don't make me force you. He's going to uh hold on to Nihilus. Uh, and is going to slowly start to shuffle him behind Trevor, which would put him closer to the door. Mm, certainly, certainly. He's like a weak puppet doll f- following around right now. It, it looks like he, he's not even sure where he's walking right now. He looks like he's hazy and daisy. He's in full bodyguard mode right now and is just going to slowly uh, shuffle Nihilus behind him. And is just going to start eyeing that vent. Uh, using what little information that he's been given... That's probably the the main thing. Might be something in the air. He doesn't know, but he heard that from the doctor that there's scuttling coming from that vent, and he's just going to slowly start to inch his way toward uh, the vent. As you look inside of the vent, you see that around those bottom edges, there is a black ichor-like substance that pools. In fact, at the lip of the vent, you see it drips down towards the floor staining the wallpaper. It's clear that something travels through these vents frequently. If... uh, I must say, with this particular interesting foundings that we have, uh, there was reported a a multitude of people missing. If it is presumably this elf uh, that is one of them, there must be more Please get get her to talk. <laughs> and with those final words, Nihilus falls over, unconscious. Could I attempt something? Certainly, and you feel your consciousness fading in and out, so you know that you only have a second at most. Esper, fully gripped by the fear, is going to lift her hand and jab the fork into her palm. You do so. And that immediate surge of pain, it jolts you awake. You can tell that this is only temporary, but you've bought yourself just a little bit more time. (laughs) She's going to use that time, however unbalanced she is, to try and jolt towards the door out of here. Esper, you take this opportunity to run through into the hallway, crashing over a table and knocking some things over. You make your way out, but... Having ran all the way across, you slam into the wall on the other side, and everybody sees as Esper, her lights too go out, as she slumps into the wall and falls onto the floor. Dr. Glass and Trevor, now being the only ones awake, you hear a growling noise coming from the other room. Behind the wall, behind one of the doors, you hear a slithering, stepping sound. 
As the door creaks open slowly, you see this snake-like creature, part human, part amalgam, scaled skin emitting a slime. It has five legs in obscure, unexpected places, and no face to be seen except one red dot, which serves as an eye, a ball equally as slimy on its front. You can presume this to be where it sees from, as I need both of you to make a wisdom saving throw with disadvantage as it approaches, crawling onto the table, knocking over the different plates and glasses as it slithers in your direction. Oh, come on. You got this. You got this. Come on. Come on. Oh, no. Four. Ten. Trevor, its form is mesmerizing, bizarre, and unexpected as it slowly makes its approach towards you. You see yourself reflected in the eye, looking back at you, and you feel a drowsiness fall over you. As it becomes impossible to stay awake, you fall asleep. Top, run. And just collapse onto the, onto one of the uh, seats. And Dr. Glass. Nihilus and Esper on the floor behind you, and Trevor slumped in a chair in front of you, all unconscious. But then, you begin to hear music. It's beautiful and ornate. A grand piano being played, a skillful artistry of the one playing it. You stand in this room with an old-fashioned regal opulence. The table is set. Dishes, glasses, silverware, and the candelabras, they glow on the wall, creating a warm and welcoming feel, a glow to the room. There's a cornucopia of meat and vegetables on the table. The carpet, it's regal and red. There's portraits on the walls that display artistries of grand repute, and it's clearly a different time. A lot like Dr. Glass when you were a child. At the table, you see Maggie and Trevor, Esperanza and Nihilus, and several others. But all your friends you recognize, and all being here, you also recognize you're not where you were. You're in some kind of shared dream. A waiter comes in. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy tonight's dinner. Crow Perch, it's as stunning as ever. The weather is beautiful, and the mines open soon. So you best make your meal quick if you plan to make your visits with the other travelers. And she looks at him because she knows she cannot dream and cannot be forced to dream. And she wonders if that gives her some sort of power over whatever magic this is. Like it's almost a lucid dream. While I said it's like a dream, you can tell you're under some sort of effect. You feel awake. And is there anything else I can get for your meal before I leave you to your adventures? Uh, Dear waiter, before you go, I must have dozed off. I'm not in my proper mind. Are we the first group to venture in here on this fine evening. Tonight, yes. We haven't had new travelers here in quite some time, yet tonight there are five. And you see Maggie sitting at the table along with you. Looking over at Maggie, she's awake as well. And lucid? Oh, it's you. I remember you checking into the hotel. It's all fading so quickly, you see. I... I'm sorry, I... Are you all right? I don't even know where I was going with that. And what happened to our host? Are are we... Are we here to see the king? Ah, yes, your host. That's Mr. Harlan Usher. He's in his office right now, but he has an open-door policy. You're welcome to check in with him. Very gracious. There's uh, a sharp uh, scraping noise as just like... As uh, Trevor immediately stands up from the chair. What... Where are we? This ain't this ain't right. You're in your master suite, of course. 
you're not feeling well, I could draw you a bath. The other guests, they're still waking up, and as he says that, one of the other doors open. And stepping out is a beautiful woman with flowing blonde hair and outfit that's from another era, but regal nonetheless. And she seems to have a little lipstick that she's putting on with a pocket mirror open. And as she steps out, Ah, darlings! Another wonderful day at Crow Perch, isn't it? Uh, pleasure to make the acquaintance. I'm sorry, who are you? I'm surprised, but I guess I won't dwell on it. Eliza Montgomery. You might know me from some of my works, but most recently, Midnight Whispers. I'm sorry, I'm just so surprised, is all. It's quite flattering. Yes, I'm not from this continent even, so I do apologize for any rude remarks. Uh, I'm not feeling myself today, it seems. I don't even remember going in this room, to be fair. Uh, do we have to... What, what, um, how do, why do we owe the pleasure of your presence with us tonight? Is this a special occasion? Well, yes. Every day you see is a special occasion, but today in particular, today in particular, we're going to be celebrating our premiere. We've been working on this film for a long time, you see, and I'm just very proud of it is all. And across the room from the other doorway, another man emerges. He is also vintage and regal, his hair slicked to the side in this old-fashioned cut. And as he steps out, he's lighting a cigarette in his mouth. Looking over towards Eliza, he says, Oh, Eliza, so wonderful to see you again today. You're looking beautiful as ever. Um, could I ask, would Esper know that this is not one of her typical dreams? Yes, and at this point, everyone is feeling lucid, except, of course, seemingly Maggie. And Doc, is Dr. Glass familiar with Midnight Whispers? And I mean, would we all have heard of this movie? Do we know what movies are? Roll a history check with advantage. Which would make it a straight roll for me right now. Uh, that is a dirty 20. It's been a long time since you've been in Crow Perch, but when you were here, would you say 30 years ago? More, uh, like 45, 50 years ago. Trevor's just looking around like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills, just seeing everyone going along with this. Yeah, Dr. Glass throws a wrench in the works of like 30 years ago sounds like a lot, and now it's not <laughs> because she is 61 years old. <laughs> Esper notably has said absolutely nothing. She is, in fact, uh, she's she's basically curled herself into a ball in this oversized seat for herself, and she is covering her eyes with her hands. Nihilus is in a resting, confused face with one eyebrow slightly raised in a nonstop manner as he keeps trying to eye the situation. Dr. Glass... You remember when you were a young child, walking through the halls of the Whaler Hotel. One conversation stood out to you because it wasn't as optimistic and cheery as everything else on the island was at the time. It was a sad conversation, mournful. You heard two employees of the hotel at the time, and Midnight Whispers comes to mind. One was saying to the other, It's too bad about the fifth floor. I can't believe they've shut it down. It feels superstitious, but terrible what happened to that poor cast of Midnight Whispers. She is going to use a spell slot to cast... I hope she can cast spells within this. She's going to cast Detect Magic to try to find the thing to break the switch to throw find some way to change what's happening and so hopefully behind their back while the actors are focused on each other and everyone's looking at Eliza Montgomery's beautiful lipstick she's gonna cast detect magic you cast detect magic people can see you doing this and Eliza noticing immediately oh how delightful 
I see magic so rarely nowadays. You see some items do glow in your vicinity with your detect magic. Eliza's pocket mirror for one. And in the other room, there's a dagger. It's silhouetted seemingly through the wall, possibly on a bookshelf. And for some reason, for some odd reason, this detect magic is interacting with the world around you. This world that at this point you can't tell is real or not. In, in the meantime, while uh, Dr. Glass is forming the spell and Eliza is reacting, um, Trevor is just sort of like looking around. He goes, no, 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 no. Uh, there, there was a, a man there uh, with a hole in his head. There was, you was sleeping. There was a creature. I saw a creature. You've been watching too many films, my boy. As the man nearby, he sits down at the table next to you and grabs a helping of food from the center. You're a liar. Don't listen to anything that they tell you. They are... They are lying. This, this is wrong. This is the wrong that I, I thought that there was. We need to go. She's going to look right to the man at the table. He goes, you're not, you're not real. You are not. I'm sorry to say, dearie, but I'm as real as they come. Is she all right? And as he says this, another man enters from the room to the north. Oh dear, another. This one brown hair brushed to the side, also just as eloquently dressed and beautiful as the other woman. Well, uh, is everybody here okay? Steps in. Oh, Gregory, so wonderful to see you. She dons a less polite tone. Why don't you have breakfast? We have work to do. All right. And he sits down. Don't eat any of that. Uh, going to turn over to uh, Maggie to say, uh, don't eat any of that. Uh, he's going to slowly, since he stood up from sleeping, uh, he's going to walk over to uh, to Maggie and just literally push her plate away from her. The plate crashes. Oh, um, I guess I wasn't very hungry today anyway. She stands. I'm not sure what I plan to do today. Breakfast. I thought it was evening. You need to leave. We have to go. We have to go, Miss Maggie. We're leaving. Well, let's go. She looks towards the door. Dr. Glass is just using this nice distraction to kind of stealth towards the room with the dagger. Please continue. You excuse yourself, stepping away unnoticed into the room. And inside, you see a half-orc man, burly, clearly not fitting in with the rest of the crew of Midnight Whispers. Oh, uh, room service? He rubs his eyes. I'm up, I'm up. I normally don't sleep this time of day, just some quick shut eye. Uh, yes, very astute. I am clearly the housekeeper. So sorry to interrupt. Please close your eyes again, and I will just uh, dust these books very quickly. That's okay, I'm already up anyway. And he stands up out of his bed walking past you into that dining area. And as he exits, you walk towards that bookshelf, revealing that small silvered knife that was pinging on your detect magic. It's eloquent and it has these striations and a glow to it. Clearly, it's been breamed. I put it in my pocket and I return to the room. For now on your character sheet, please name it a silvered blade. And still confused, pleased with herself, but uh, no more illuminated. She returns to the main room and uh, fixes her eye on that pocket mirror. Uh, sorry to interrupt everyone. I do have a couple of questions. I'm not that quite familiar in the works of films or its project. How long does it take to um, uh, create one such film and what is it about? Now he's asking the good questions. You mind, Eliza? No, no. I know you love talking about these things. Of course. What's your name, sir? Um, 
Nihilus von Stone. Uh, uh, which one are you again, sir? Yeah, yeah, I'm Adrian Mitchell, the director. You know those horror stories that come from the archaeologists at the College of the Arcane Void? We got our hands on something juicy. Midnight Whispers is about the darkness of the minds and the whispers of the things that go bump in the night. A cinematic masterpiece, if you ask me. As for how we do it, we have an arcanist who burns a minor illusion into a piece of glass. That's, uh, how long, long does it take to uh, the, the entire project of one such film? What, what year did you start it at? Oh, this? We've been working on this one all year. We're premiering it tonight. Eliza there, she's the star of the show. She gives a little wave. Eliza Montgomery, remember that name, it's going to be famous one day. Gregory Thornton, over there, co-star. And my friend here, Constantine. He's our guide to the island. Constantine? Does sound familiar. Hmm. Um, well, why do we in particular owe the pleasure of meeting these to-be stars on this fine morning? As for why you're here, I couldn't speak for that. Only you could. But I do know that the mines are the reason that most people come to the island. There's a resource they discovered called Broom. They use it to imbue metal. Apparently it makes it stronger and more corrosion-resistant. But that's not my field. Maybe that's why you're here. Maybe you're just on vacation. I don't even know why you're asking me. That's... But we thought with all the hype surrounding it, why not premiere the film here, where there's the most people? But the, the, the mines have been open for many a year, are they not? Maybe three. And he looks towards the rest of he looks towards the rest of the party and in a rude, crude manner, he kind of ignores the rest and he asks the party, are we in a memory of the past? Uh, <laughs> mentally, in, into his mind, their glasses. Yes, nice. Yes. And how long have you all been visiting this hotel then? Well, I just checked in a couple days ago, but Eliza been here about a week. Isn't that right, Eliza? Yes. I quite enjoy it here. The beaches are wonderful, and I love those little shops. And don't get me started on that boardwalk. We shan't, dear. Wes, I know this is an obnoxious question that DMs hate, but was there a particular school of magic that Dr. Glass clocked off those two items? The dagger enchantment and the pocket mirror divination. I then, before there's popping off, she is going to say... That's such a lovely pocket mirror. Did you acquire that at the shops? I've had this for quite some time. I got it in Sovereign Seagate. There's a magic shop there, you see. Oh, it's magical. Yes, it allows me to do my makeup perfectly. It shows me what I should look like, and I copy it. Should according to whom? It seems to show me what I want to see. And ever since I started using it, it allowed me to get more eyes, to draw more attention... Perhaps it's also what others want to see. Well, don't draw too many more eyes, dear. I think you look lovely with just the two. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back. And she goes into the empty bedroom and casts Detect Thoughts and returns. And meanwhile, Nihilus, he was starting to write down all the names in a small notepad that he kept on his pocket. And then he asks openly to the room, And who again is this Harland Usher? Ah, yes. The butler speaks up by the door. Harland is our proprietor. His work is so prolific that this hotel itself is now a landmark for the new Port Hillcrest. And he looks Maggie dead in the eye. Uh, say, Maggie, what is your profession? It's all a bit foggy, but I believe I worked at the Salted Stout for a number of years. The Salted Stout? You mean the one that's outside under construction? That's odd. I... Suppose so. Was who was was that Adrian or Gregory? That was Adrian Mitchell. And one more thing: when you cast detect thoughts, you hear a chattering of a crowd, and you feel unable to zone in to one particular voice. As Nihilus is writing down all the notes in his notebook, he kind of flips it back close, and he looks over the readily agitated Trevor if that is a correct uh, reaction he closes it oh yeah he's flabbergasted and he gives a thumbs up that's all I needed I listen uh, I don't care if we're in a, a memory of the past like like you said pointing over at Nihilus 
Uh, you said uh, this this usher guy. He he's in charge. He's he's actually walking over to Adrian, and he's going to like grip him by the lapels. Uh, yes, sir. What is the meaning of this? Where is he? You said open door policy. I want to walk through this open door. Yeah, yeah. He's right out the door. Up one up le- level. This office. Let go of me. Sets him down. What does Gregory think about Adrian being threatened? Does he like it? <laughs> Gregory has his feet on the table, and you see a grin on his face. He almost seems to be enjoying this. And Eliza looks completely unsurprised, as if it's not the first time that Adrian has found himself in a, a bind like this. Though, maybe this time she can't clock exactly what he did. I'm going there. Anyone who's leaving might want to follow me. He begins to make for the door. Nihilus gets up and follows, having a... A last look back at Maggie, but with a, with a sad grin on his face, he just continues to follow Trevor, leaving her in her fate. Since she spent the spell slot, Dr. Glass does want to find out who's the bad guy amongst the cast. She's got her detect thoughts focused on Eliza, and she says, Well, that was a bit alarming, but uh, I believe his name was Gregory, seemed a bit amused to see your friend Adrian get roughed up. Please roll a quick persuasion check, just so I can get a pulse on the conversation. I'm trying. <laughs> roll for Riz. I just want to get her thinking about it so I can hear those thoughts. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's the first one, but I have disadvantage. Of course, the first one was excellent. And now I can't. Your cat is blessing your rolls. Uh, you should have blessed the second one, cat. So that's a nine persuasion. She gives you a little smirk, and she looks over towards you. Why don't you come to my room, darling? All right, so I don't want this to spread among the tabloids, but you should know, since we're going to be living together, that Adrian and I, we we have something special. We love one another. Gregory, he doesn't understand. He, I think he's a bit jealous, to be honest. And what do I hear her think that she censors with detect thoughts when she says, let's put it this way? Like, what, what, what was the real, what was the worst version? When you summon your ability to detect thoughts, you hear a crowd, not just one voice. It all comes to you at the same time. So if you're going to go and capture one voice in particular, you will have to roll for it. Um, and my save is only 13 right now, so I think I'll continue with the conversation and just eat the spell slot. I have a feeling I'm dealing with something wise that I don't want to piss off. (laughs) Uh, And it might break my mind. I hope that's enough information for you, darling. I don't want to drag you through the mud of idle gossip. So Gregory's not a a bad fellow or anything. He's just concerned for the work. I've been working with Gregory for years. He'll get over it as he always does. I just, you know, I'm a bit of an I can't, I'm a bit of an auntie. I can't help it. I see a a lovely young woman like you and I want to make sure she's doing okay, surrounded by all these men. She puts her hand on your shoulder. That's so sweet. You'll be my auntie. I won't take anything else. Uh, Might I borrow your mirror just briefly to check my own maquillage? Oh, yes, of course. Why don't you take a look? And she opens the mirror and hands it to you. And yes, I I take a peek. Please describe the best form of Dr. Isadora Glass, because that will be what she sees. Something ideal. Ooh. She sees eyes. Eyes and cheekbones. And rosy lips. Rosy lips that don't need lipstick as she was told in her youth though she does enjoy lipstick but the biggest thing she sees is her green grey eyes and in this mirror the light hits them perfectly so that there is a sheen of starlight Uh, and her hair is perfectly her curls fall perfectly to frame her angular face. Quite interesting, is it not? It uh, takes me back to when I cared about such things. I suppose I got lucky with this one. 
but when I retire, I'll be sure to give it to you. I hope you're not retiring soon enough to give it to me, darling. Now, sadly, I do have to get ready. I have a quick walk with a friend, and then I need to get ready for the ball tonight. Yes, and that... that, uh... dashing half-orc gentleman, he's in the film as well? No, no, he's employed by the production as our protection while we're on the island. I'm so tempted to lock her in the closet for her own safety. Yeah, no, I think I'll go catch up with the group now. As best I can. <laughs> Esper, are you tagging along with Trevor? Uh, Esper is not going to leave Dr. Glass alone, but she also didn't leave the table yet. She is, um, she is making attempts to persuade Maggie to come along. Yes, I mean, I don't think I have anything better to do today, so sure, I'll come along. Yes, it's 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 a very nice hotel. I I think it'd be really great to take a look. Doctor Doctor Glass, do you want to come as well? Yes, I'm 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 right here, dear. Don't fret. Come come here, Maggie, and and Esper's gonna reach her hand up and offering to Maggie. Yes, I'm coming. And she briskly follows along. And Trevor, as you get out into the hall, you don't see the elevator. Mm-hmm. Instead, you see a grand staircase. As you round the staircase, something catches your eye. There's a portrait on the wall, and it's of the Black Bulls, the mercenary group, Trevor, that you used to ride with back in another lifetime, it seems, at this point, back before your injury. <clears throat> As he's like, he's basically stomping his way down the hallway. Those who are trailing behind him can see he's a man on a mission. And then as soon as, like, the vaguest glimpse of it hits his peripheral vision, it's like he hits a wall. He just stops. His head slowly turns to look at it. (sighs) And once again, it's like he's not here. This goes on for probably about 10 seconds waiting for the rest of them to catch up with him. Dr. Glass looks up when she catches up, looks up at the portrait, curious about what Trevor's looking at. Does, I suppose I wouldn't know this, but does everyone see what I see? Yes, there's a group of the bulls all standing around a campfire, and you see yourself, a younger, perhaps more bright-eyed, cheery version that used to be. What's this here? That is you, is it not, Trevor? He doesn't say anything in response. He just sort of gives a nod. Have something you want to share? No. Have Have you never been here before? <sighs> no. We need to get to the bottom of this firmly quick. I'm sorry, Trevor. Don't look at it. It's Why not? Because it will only serve to disturb you. It's invading our minds. That's what it wants. I'm not disturbed. That's the happiest I ever was. He's going to slowly shake his head. He's going to look across to uh, the corridor where he started to walk. Office of Harlan Usher, written on one of the doors just ahead of you. Let's go. Right. He just sort of whispers under his breath and just makes his way to the door. He doesn't bother knocking. He's just opening the door. You see an office that might as well be a movie set. It's almost gimmicky. The maps, the globes, the animal heads on the walls. This is the office of somebody who likes opulence. From the windows across the office, you see the city. The sun in the distance, though, oddly having this black spot on it. It doesn't change the lighting or anything outside, but... It doesn't belong there. But sitting at the desk, you see Harlan Usher, a pencil mustache, and an outfit that just screams luxury. Ladies, gentlemen, so wonderful to see you tonight. Beautiful you look. How can I help? So he seems well. He seems he's not at all like Maggie. No. In fact, if I remember correctly from the last session, he's a lot less dead than I first described him. Trevor 
being the first one to enter. He stops a, for a moment. Uh, let's Usher finish his speech and just turns back behind. He realizes that he's not in a stable state of mind. So he is looking behind him to see what the rest of the people are doing. And if they're being passive, he's going to start marching forward. Is there an issue with the utensils? I certainly hope not. I think I think I will keep this one, thank you. Uh, y- yes, yes, of course. River is going to start advancing uh, down uh, across the floor to the... Uh, is he, like, seated at a desk, or...? He had stood up and rounded the desk, walked over to his globe, and gave it a little spin as he begins, Well, tell me about your stay. I'm here to help as your proprietor. He, uh, goes right up against the desk, and he's just, like, got his hands braced against the desk, uh, with, you know, he was walking there with such force that he almost causes it to shift as he, like, suddenly stops himself on the desk itself. You're in charge? All right. Where are we? What is this? This ain't where we were. And you're going to explain where we are right now. Yeah, yeah, I'll explain. Sure, hold your horses. And he picks up a book from the table, a copy of the Testimonium Veritas that Nihilus holds. Ooh. You're in the Whaler Hotel, on the beautiful island of Crow Perch. The weather is stunning, the mines are in the distance but nearby, and there is plenty to do to enjoy yourself here. Trevor's hand is going to lunge forward, uh, trying to grab at the book he now has in his hand. If he had his eyes in the book for even a moment, he's going to try and not grab the book from him, but just sweep it out of his hands and just get him to drop it. Oh? Careful with that. That's on me, motherfucker. You slam the book out of his hand and it flies across the room, hitting the wall on the other side. No. Yes, I must have answered that wrong. You're in my office, Harlan Usher. Uh, I am uh, your host, and uh, you're staying. That ain't where we are. That ain't where we are. You're lying to me. How do we get out? Dr. Glass, in this moment, you start to notice a light tremor in the air. That blot in the sun, it shimmers lightly. And Harlan continues, Right, right, I apologize. I, I, I was wrong again. Wrong again. Uh, actually, you're you're standing in my office before me, and uh, and and the hotel, uh, and 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 it's crow, it's crow perch. Um, we aren't looking for where. You're lying about when we are. Of course, of course, I misunderstood. Um, okay, yes, I, I apologize. We're in the fifteenth age. We just transitioned officially. It's fifteen a o one. Is that is that what you want to know? What? You think you're fucking funny? That's not right. I'm trying my best to be the opposite of funny, sir. I promise you. Why do you have that painting out back? The the paintings in the hotel come from all over the world. I like my guests to to I like them to feel special being here and feel this is a special place. Um, and, and so I, I couldn't tell you about a particular painting. Is there is there a pr- particular painting that you want to hear about? You are fucking yanking my chain. Um, get close. If not being so fucking polite. So, the answer. All right, you run this place. It ain't where we were. You seem, you seem like honest gentlemen. But you're still in charge. So, you're my best chance of getting out of here. You keep jerking me around like this, and I swear to God. I swear to God, I will pry the answers out of your fucking skull! As you say that, everything begins to shake again. Even the blot in the sun vibrates within its silhouette. The cabinets all shake, the glasses all tremor, but it doesn't seem like Harlan Usher notices a thing. And Dr. Glass, in this moment, you feel your otherworldly connection growing just a little bit stronger. As Harlan continues, All right, all right, I... Clearly, I'm not giving you the answers you want. What would you like me to say, sir? I'm going to vault over the desk, pushing him uh, back as I do so, with my forearm uh, against his chest, the other one up against his lapel, 
just going to go. How do we get out? If you give me the answers, I won't have to take them. As you slam him again, everything begins to shake yet again, but this time more violently. The bookcases crash down to the floor, the chandelier drops, and you see a crack propagate up the walls. I don't know, man. I don't know. I told you everything I know. We're in Port Hillcrest. We're on the island of Crow Birch. He's going to punch the wall right beside his head. Not good enough. And he is going to, ripping him by the lapels again, turn 180 degrees, and he's going to throw him across the desk. As you throw him, you see his head snap back, hit one of the shelves, and crack backwards hard. And as this happens, your world begins to fall apart. As the floor cracks beneath you, you fall through it as you see the entire hotel starting to collapse as that blot in the sun, it grows to eclipse the entire light that is cast from it. And you fall. You fall farther and farther until you fall into your chairs around the dining table of the room you passed out in. Awake. You see the beast on the table engulfing Maggie's head. She is clearly no more. And for the moment as you wake up, you know that this beast has not yet seen you. I need everybody to roll initiative as this is where we'll end the session for now. Thank you for listening to this remastered episode of The Stranger. Not every episode will be dubbed like this one was. And it should be noted that in redubbing this episode, we did shorten and change some of the content just to make this episode a little bit more condensed and easy to get through quickly. The best way to help us grow is to like, share, and comment about what your favorite part of the episode was. If you want to help more, Help Roll for Impact make high quality production content like this forever by holding a candle for us because your support lights our way. Subscribe to our Patreon for exclusive content, campaigns, discussions, and more. Thank you for listening, and until next time.